I want you to go through the whole Qur'an with me. Join me at bayina.tv Alhamdulillah alladhi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina man yahdihi allahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah wa nashadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأنحكم بينهم بما أنزل الله ولا تتبع أهواءهم واحذرهم أن يفتنوك عن بعض ما أنزل الله إليك فإن تولوا فاعلم أن ما يريد الله أن يصيبهم ببعض ذنوبهم وإن كثيرا من الناس لفاسقون أفحكم الجاهلية يبغون ومن أحسن من الله حكما لقوم يوقنون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين one of the last surahs to be revealed in the quran to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is surah al maida it's the fifth surah in the order of the mushaf and is one of the final revelations given to rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that revelation, there's a lot of conversation between Allah Azza wa Jal te teaching His Messenger what to say والسلام, to the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, particularly the Christians. There's quite a bit of discourse with the Christian community. This makes historical sense because by the end of the Prophet's career والسلام, we were already engaged with the Roman Empire. So it was already clear that the Muslims are going to be dealing with the Christian civilization quite a bit. And particularly what the Qur'an does is something unique that you don't find in other religious traditions. The Qur'an does not try to preach to the average follower of a different faith. It actually went after the most knowledgeable among them. So the people of knowledge among the people of the book, the, the rabbis, the priests, the ministers, etc., it would talk to them. You see, it's easier to talk to somebody from a different religion who don't know much about their own religion, and you could say, well, here's what our religion teaches, and they don't have anything of their own to cross-reference it against. But what Allah did in the Qur'an is He would go to the scholars of the Israelites, He would go, Allah, He would command His Messenger to go talk to the priests and the ministers and say, open up your book. Hatu burhanakum. Bring what you have. Because what, what we have, what this revelation is, is a confirmation of what they had. Regardless, is, as part of that conversation, Allah Azza wa Jal told him, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ We sent this revelation down to you with purpose. This book has been sent down and the laws in it, the, the right and the wrong in it, has been sent down to you, these guidelines, for true purpose. And then he says, it's also serving the purpose of confirming the truth of previous scripture. And it guards over the truth that's in previous scripture. وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ then he adds, Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, فَحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ Therefore, make judgments between them based on what Allah has sent down. And this comment isn't just limited to the Christian or the Jewish people and to tell, you know, pass judgments about what they're saying based on revelation, but this is a universal you know, principle given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when people come to him, even the Muslims, when they come to him and they come with any issue, now go back to Allah's word and give them the answer from Allah's word. Now on that point, before I go on, I want to help everybody here understand something. Allah and in the, in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, you don't find the answer to every one of your questions. Sometimes we have questions like people ask all the time, what does the Quran say about in-laws? Or what does it say about crazy cousins? Or what does it say about your uncle who does this, that or the other? And people have very specific situations and they want to, say, they want to know what the Quran says about this situation or this situation, or how did the Prophet ﷺ deal with that situation, etc. But all of your situations don't necessarily get uh, occur in the Prophet's life What the revelation does give us is principles. So there are many situations in the book and in the sunnah of the Prophet but what we get from those, those, those situations are principles. 
And once you learn those principles, they can apply to any situation. There are certain things that are explicitly right and wrong, they're halal and haram, those we have to be clear about, but beyond that, we have to really understand the principles of our religion. Fairness, you know, uh, equality, justice, these kinds of principles that are there that have to be applied in any circumstance. But anyway, what I wanted to highlight today for you is what Allah says to these people that come to Him for judgment, but he warns his Prophet ﷺ, when people come to you, and of course the Prophet ﷺ is not among us anymore, so his words are among us, and the words Allah gave him, the Qur'an is among us, right? So in the ayah, it's describing a scene where people come to the Prophet ﷺ. But for us, it's describing the same scene when we come to Islam, when we come to the word of Allah, when we come to the words of the Prophet ﷺ, seeking an answer, when we do that. So even though he's personally not with us, his words are with us. The teachings that were given to him are with us. So that attitude that someone used to have towards meeting the Prophet ﷺ in person is the same attitude you and I have to have when we come to the word of Allah and we come to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ as if we're meeting him in person and he's giving us this verdict. Of course, once you understand it properly. So what warning did Allah give to his messenger ﷺ? He says, وَأَنِحْكُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ First of all, make judgments between them based on what Allah sent down, meaning Allah's word is the final verdict. Nothing goes higher than the word of Allah. Allah describes His own words as وَكَلِمَةُ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The word of Allah is in the highest possible place. It's the highest. There's nothing that can be higher than the word of Allah, than the Qur'an. So first and foremost, the Prophet is being commanded وسلم, that when people come to you, give them your, their answers based on what Allah has given you, بِمَا أَنزَلَ Allah. In, with what Allah has sent down. Now, the, the first warning after that. وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ And don't follow their empty feelings. Don't follow their whims. Some people come to you with a lot of anger. And they want an answer that justifies their anger. They have an anger towards someone in their family or someone in their business or someone else. And they want an Islamic answer to justify their rage against someone else. Give me an ayah or a hadith that I can slap them with. You know, they have their hawa, and they want you to use the religion for their hawa. And somebody else comes to you with greed. And they say that, I know this business is kind of haram, but can you give me some justification so it's not that haram? So it's a little bit less haram, it's not like capital H, it's lowercase h. Maybe reduce the font size a little bit, and that should be okay. Well, you know, this is people's whims. You want to take the word of Allah, which is constant, but your feeling goes this way or this way because of love, because of hate, because of greed, because of fear, because of anxiety, any of these feelings, and you want to bend the word of Allah to your will. So your will and my will, my, my, my feelings, are now actually superior to the word of Allah, ma'adullah. Because it's no longer in the highest place. Now the highest place belongs to my own feelings. My own feelings should make the word of Allah submit to my feelings. So the Prophet ﷺ is being warned when people come to you and you give them a verdict, make sure that you don't fall into their feelings. Now it's not to say that the Qur'an doesn't care about how you feel. The Qur'an actually is very concerned with the sadness of people, with the pain of people. Allah would even sometimes give revelation and say, I gave this revelation so it would, it would give cleansing and it would give healing to the heart, to the feelings of a believing group of people. Sometimes Allah will give us revelation just to give us comfort. And there are many occasions of that in the, in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but the shaitan's job is to actually change, take everything beautiful and make it ugly. And to take everything ugly and make it beautiful. So the, the deen of Allah, the, the laws of Allah, actually came to protect us from the harm we can do to ourselves. Our, you know, just like a child, right? A child does, has uncontrolled emotions uncontrolled desires. If, you should, if, if a child likes chocolate and they have the feeling that they want to eat chocolate all day and you say, well, that makes them feel good, just keep giving it to them, you're killing this child. You're causing their dental problems. You're causing them to have stomach aches. You're hurting them because you're following their feelings. Well, in a larger sense, human beings can be childish. Human beings can actually act like their feelings are, all I care about is how, what I want to do. 
just let me be happy. Doesn't matter what the word of Allah says. And when we do that, we're, we're actually causing harm to ourselves. So what Allah does is He says sometimes, He teaches us that sometimes our own feelings are actually the biggest danger to ourselves. They're the biggest danger to ourselves. You know? He says, وَأُمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَاهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ The one who feared standing in front of his master and was able to stop them, their own self from, getting, from running into one feeling after the other. Like they, they stopped their whims from dictating all of their actions. You know, in, in the world of marketing, I've given you this example before. When I was in business school, in the world of marketing, we studied like grocery stores, right? And in grocery stores, they, the way they lay them out to this day, I, mean, I studied it in like 1875, but whatever. Now, even nowadays, it's the same. When you go into a grocery store, most people go to the grocery store to get some milk, some eggs, and some bread. So you would think it's logical that they should put the milk, eggs, eggs and bread right at the entrance. So people can come, grab it, and go to the cash register. But they put the milk, bread, and eggs all the way on the farthest end, as far away from the entrance as possible. And the reason they do that is they want you to go through all of these products and your feeling will come, eh, I should just grab that. I should just put that in here too. Put that in here too. Put that in here too. They, they, they're hoping your whims dictate your judgments. They're hoping for that, you know. And then the, you'll notice that at the cash, at the exit, it's the most unhealthy products that taste the, the, the sweetest are right there at the cash register. Because as you leave, just follow your taste. Put some more candy in there. Put some Tic Tacs in there, put some Twix or chocolate or whatever in there. You, you see that? So the idea is that human beings, by and large, we have a feeling, we just want to act on it. Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us otherwise. He teaches us to control our emotions. So He says, He tells us to His Prophet, the first warning is when you give them their judgments, don't make your judgments bend to their feelings. Don't make them, the judgments that Allah has given are already taking into, the, into consideration what's best for you, based on your feelings even. He knows better about us than we know about ourselves. In one place in the Quran, Allah even says, You're going to teach Allah your religion. You know better than Allah. Because sometimes we hear something Allah wants us to do, and our immediate response is, But, but what about? And our, there's a counter in our head. No. No, give me something else. That wasn't, that's not what I feel like. It doesn't feel like it's uh, good for me. Our feelings are stronger than even the word of Allah. We have counters to it. So he says, he warns him, first of all, don't let them fall, don't fall into their whims. Then he says, وَحْذَرْهُمْ And then he says, be careful about them. Watch out for them. And these are the people of the book that are coming and asking the Prophet ﷺ questions about revelation, but also anybody who comes and asks him. He says, be careful of the ones who ask you. Because the ones who come to the religion, sometimes they become a majority or they become a huge number of people. And then they say, you know what? We, don't, we want this religion to fit in with the majority's opinion. We want everybody's more comfortable if the verdict of Islam was this way or that way. So let's just have enough people that can lobby and we can change the law of Allah just a little bit or interpret it a little bit differently so it fits in better with our community. It fits in better with our comfort, uh, uh, with our comfort zone. So let's reinterpret all of this because we're not so comfortable with the old way of looking at things. So he says, وَحْذَرْهُمْ and then he teaches us in the scariest part, the warning to the Prophet ﷺ, and therefore to us when we seek answers in our religion. He says, an yaftinuka an ma anzalallahu ilayk. That they might actually put you into trial regarding some of the things Allah has revealed to you. They start testing you about some of Allah's revelation. In other words, somebody says, let me put it this way. You know when you're shopping, for example, if you're shopping for a home, you're like, I like the neighborhood. I like the first floor. I'm not so sure about the second floor. I like all of this. I don't like this. Or when you order food from a, a restaurant, you like most of what's on the plate. You leave some of the salad behind. You're like, oh, I'm not crazy about the salad. In other words, you pick. You pick. You don't like everything. You like some parts. You take some parts. And we become consumers of the parts we like most. And we bring that attitude like a consumer to the religion and say, I like the prayers. Those are pretty good in Islam. But this whole, this whole riba thing, I'm not, you know, it's a little too inconvenient. And this whole, like, pro, these certain prohibitions on our diet, that's a little too much. And this is haram and that's, that's I don't know. And this is, this is mandatory also. And these inheritance laws, I don't, you know, 
I, if, we, if we follow these inheritance laws, then I have to give my brother an equal share as myself, but I don't like my brother. Nobody likes my brother. Let's keep him out of the inheritance. So let's not follow. We, we can follow other parts of the law, but there are some parts of the law we're not comfortable with, so let's leave those alone. And you know what people do? People come up with the, the greatest scam. They say, we're going to ignore the word of Allah when it comes to money. We're going to ignore the word of Allah when it comes to certain halal and haram. But we'll go to Umrah every year and we'll take pictures at the Kaaba, selfies with the haram behind us, because on Judgment Day we're going to collect those, right? So we're going to take a picture at the haram, you know, put ihram on and show people how spiritual you are, because that's really important. That's why we go there to take pictures. Do that so that you feel good that you at least do something for Islam, while at the same time violating the major teachings of the religion, you know? And what people do in, in any religion, in, in the psychology of religion, Allah describes this in Surah An-Nisa. He says, إِن تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْهَوْنَ عَنْهُ نُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَنُدْخِلْكُمْ مُدْخَلًا كَرِيمًا He says, if you can stay away from the major sins, then the smaller ones Allah will overlook. The smaller ones you make istighfar, Allah will overlook. You know what people do? They do the smaller good deeds while they want to hold on to major sins. And they say, well, since I'm doing these smaller good deeds, you tell yourself, then these majors, Allah will overlook that. Because look, look at what I'm doing. At least I'm memorizing a surah. At least I came to Ramadan. At least I did that. Like you decide and I decide what part of the word of Allah, what we're going to offer Allah is up to us. We decide what the priorities are. That's not how this religion works. That actually starts to redefine our entire relationship with Allah. Allah is the master. We are the slaves. The master tells us what's important and what's not. The master tells us what's the mandatory requirement and what is the extra activity. The master tells us what's absolutely impermissible and what's okay. He decides that. We don't get to negotiate that on our terms. To give you a, a small example of that so you, this concept sits in your mind well, if you get a job, and you just got a new job, and your boss says, I want you to do project A and project B, and when you're finished with those two, if, you, if you're done during the day, and you have some time left, you can work on C. That's all, that's your, your three tasks, A, B, and C. That's all you gotta do. And you go in there and you say, A is kinda hard. And B, I don't like too much, it's boring. But C, I love. So I'm just gonna work on C all day. And you work on C all day. And the boss says, how'd it go today? I was great, I really loved work, here's my work. And he says, wait, I told you to work on A and B. And you say, yeah, but those, you know, but look at my C. It's so good, right? You're going to get fired because you don't decide what's important. You don't decide what's priority. The boss decides. The same way Allah decides what's the priority in my religion and your religion. We don't get to re you know, renegotiate those and reorder those and say, well, here are the things I don't want to do for Allah. Here are the, th here are the crimes I want to continue to commit. Here are the lies I want to continue to tell, but I'll make up for it with these other extra activities, so it should be okay. That's just a way of us lying to ourselves. Now the, the warning given to the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Al-Ma'idah is أَنْ يَفْتِنُكَ عَنْ بَعْضِ مَا أَنْزَلَ الله فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا And by the way, if they want to make you slip from just some parts of Revelation. See, the, the wording is not, they want you to turn away from all of Revelation. They just want to bend some parts of what Allah has said. The other parts they're okay with. The other parts are fine. Just some parts that don't fit with me or don't fit with my preferences. Allah says, what's the consequence of it? فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا Then if they were to turn their backs, فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّمَ اللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يُصِيبَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ ذُنُوبِهِمْ Then you should know that Allah intends to strike them with calamity because of some of the sins that they're committing. Meaning, this isn't just something that will affect someone in the next life. This will affect someone in this life. There will be problems coming your way and my way when we start compromising the word of Allah knowingly. Knowingly something was haram and we made it halal for ourselves or we decided not to think about it. We know it's in the back of our head, it's wrong, but we don't want to deal with it. We just want to pretend it's not there and keep going about our business as, as if everything's okay. If we do this rationalization to ourselves, Allah guarantees to His Messenger وسلم, that is an act of turning away from the word of Allah and the consequence of that is calamity will strike you because of some of your own sins here. You don't have to wait for it in the next life either. It'll come here. Some health problem will come. Some family crisis will come. Some, you know, some, some financial issue will come. 
Some emotional trouble will come. Depression might strike someone. Anxieties might strike someone. Sickness might strike someone. They, it may come in all kinds of, you know, the musibah is not just some physical injury. Musibah can be emotional. It can be, it, it can be something in your mind. You could lose your peace of mind. You can't even go to sleep. You're, you're constantly worried and negative all the time. And it's, it's draining your soul. It's eating away at you. And you know, what can so solve this problem? Who can I go to to solve this problem? And you know, even though I'm a major believer in therapy and seeking counseling and all of that stuff, but one part of this solution, if Allah has taken the peace out of someone's heart because they keep disobeying Him, then no matter what therapy you go to, that peace will not come back because it only comes from Allah. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَى قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah sent His own tranquility onto the hearts of believers. Allah sends there's a part of your peace that will come from that. Yeah, you can do yoga, and you can do some exercise, and you can do some you know, mindfulness ex exercises and feel better about it. That'll, that'll work. It works. It's great. But there's a part of you that's going to feel more and more broken, and that's just going to be an escape. And that's, that, that peace will only come when we are honest with ourselves. And we say, I'm not going to play with Allah's words anymore. I'm not going to play this game with Allah anymore. I acknowledge that I did that. I acknowledge that I, I deliberately ignored the word of Allah and I refuse to do that for myself anymore. I will no longer harm myself. Allah says, you should know Allah only intends to strike them because of some of their own sins. And, and huge numbers of people are truly corrupt and their corruption comes out. Look at the wording of the ayah, Anas. He says this is not just a Muslim thing, this is not just a Christian thing or a Jewish thing or a Hindu, it's a human thing. Human beings know something is wrong, they want to do it anyway. So he says, human beings have, so many of them fall into this kind of corruption. But the scariest of these ayat is the next one. It's a rhetorical question from Allah. The, 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 the rule of jahiliyyah, now jahiliyyah means a couple of things. Let me explain that in a couple of minutes to you. Jahiliyyah, one meaning of jahiliyyah is the time before the Qur'an came in Arabia. Asr al-jahiliyyah, zaman al-jahiliyyah, okay? So there was Jahiliyyah and then there's Islam. Jahiliyyah means the age of ignorance, when there was no light of revelation, when there was darkness. So the ayah says, are they looking to judge their lives? Are they looking to live their lives like they did before revelation ever came? Is that what they want? They want to go back to the old way of doing things? That's one way you can interpret this question that Allah is asking. Another way you can look at this question is actually the root meanings of the word Jahiliyyah, Jahl. Jahl doesn't just mean ignorance. Jahl means the inability to control your emotions, to be impulsive, to follow your whim, to follow your, gr your, your, your greed, your lust, your temper. Whatever feeling it is, you just follow it. You just follow it, you fall into it. He says, do, would they like to follow the rule of whatever they feel like? Would they like to be impulsive throughout? And he says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا And who's going to be better than Allah in giving verdicts? In other words, either we are following Jahiliyyah or we're following the word of Allah. The scary thing about this ayah is it's talking at the end of Revelation. 23, almost 23 years of Revelation have already come. And now Allah says, still there are people that would like to live their lives as, this, as if there's no Qur'an, as if there's no word of Allah, as if it's just an inconvenient truth. The only thing we can do, we don't want to follow it, but we'll like to put it in a really nice shiny cover and put it on a shelf somewhere. So, you know, it'll feel good because we have it. I got a really nice copy from the store. I got a frame in my house too. Look at all this calligraphy. SubhanAllah, Allah Akbar. Look at the calligraphy. It looks so beautiful. But following it, no. Let's just, let's just perfect our tajweed of it. Let's just recite it beautifully. If that's what they're doing, then that's hukmul jahiliya. Afa hukmul jahiliya tiyabhun. Are they, in a contemporary way, I translate, are they really pursuing... The, the, the verdict of whims? The verdict of the times of ignorance? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ Who can be more, who can give better verdicts than Allah for a people that actually have conviction? And that's the last comment I want to share with you. The question Allah asked, who can be better than Allah at giving a verdict, at giving a judgment about what you and I should do with our lives, what choices we should make? When he says those words, he adds لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ For any group of people that are looking to have conviction. If you and I are not convinced 
that what Allah says is the very best thing for you and me. If we're not convinced of that, if we don't think that Allah knows better, <coughs> what's good for me more than even I know for myself, if that conviction is not there, then hukmul jahiliyyah becomes easy. And following the way of whims becomes easy. And if that, if that has been the case for you and me, if it has been the case that we're not following the word of Allah, and we're you know, mindlessly, you know, without conscience, we keep following the way of our own whims, if we keep falling into those traps, you know what that, is? that means? We're not seeking to have real conviction in the word of Allah. We don't give it its place. We might have respect for it, we might be you know, anthropologically Muslim, meaning it's been passed down to us and we belong to the Muslim civilization. We have Muslim names, we say salam to each other, we show up at Jum'ah and stuff, but really it's not the way we see the world. It's the, the word of Allah is not the highest word. It's not the, the one that decides all of our matters. It's not the one that gives us principles that once, once these principles are given, nothing will, I will not go around these principles. We don't, I give you guys the silly example all the time of traffic lights. When you stop at a traffic light, you don't say, I'm not in the mood today, I'm not feeling very spiritual, I'm going to go through it. You don't do that because you realize that's a constant. You're not going to mess with it. You're not going to mess with that because that's, that's a law of a, an authority higher than you. And you're convinced that that's an authority higher than you. And in fact, you're also convinced that if I cut a red light, then I might get slammed into from the other side. There's a harm that will come to me if I cut this red light, if I just go into the highway and jump right in without looking around. I, it's going to actually bring me harm. Why, where is that conviction when it comes to the word of Allah? This is, I, I told, in these 30 seconds, I just remind myself and I remind all of you, Allah created two worlds. There's the seen world and there's the unseen world. In the seen world, there are laws like gravity, right? If I, if I drop something, it'll fall to the ground. That's gravity. Allah created these principles and fire will burn. You know, fire will burn. These, these, are, these are things everybody knows. The same way certain actions have certain reactions, right? That's what the physical world is. That's what we study in chemistry and physics and biology, etc., etc. The same way in the unseen world, in the moral world, there's also a kind of physics. There's also a kind of action and reaction. So when you decide not to follow the word of Allah, you might not immediately see a physical reaction. If you lie, you're not going to see a lightning strike come and burn your tongue. That's not going to happen. If you steal, your hand is not going to become paralyzed for the next 45 minutes. Ah, oh, you stole. Allah says, you don't get to use this hand now because you did haram. That's not going to happen. But what will happen, what will in fact happen, is that Allah Azza wa Jal will give us consequences in this life in ways we cannot physically see. Maybe those consequences will come now. Maybe they'll come 10 years from now. Maybe they'll come you know, to the world around us. But there are absolutely consequences. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that we protect ourselves from those consequences and abide by the rules of Allah that He has given to us for our own benefit. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us take a really good look at our own selves and be honest with ourselves and really, really truly develop a fear and an and a consciousness and an appreciation that Allah has given us a gift. قَدْ أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكُمْ ذِكْرًا Allah has given, it, given you a beautiful reminder. A reminder for yourselves. May Allah Azza wa help us take in that reminder and really illuminate our lives with it. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَاتِ وَالذِّكْرِ